all mother sentient beings, limitless as space, have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May they not be separate from the sacred happiness that is free of sorrow. May they rest in equanimity, free of attachment and aversion. Until awakening, I take refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merit of generosity and other virtues, may I attain Buddhahood for the benefit of all beings. Until awakening, I take refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merit of generosity and other good deeds, may I attain Buddhahood for the benefit of all beings. Until awakening, I take refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merit of generosity and other good deeds, may I attain Buddhahood for the benefit of all beings. May all mother sentient beings, limitless as space, have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May they not be separated from the happiness that is free of sorrow. And may they rest in equanimity, free of attachment and aversion. May all mother sentient beings, limitless as space, have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May they not be separated from the happiness that is free of sorrow. And may they rest in equanimity, free of attachment and aversion. May all mother sentient beings, limitless as space, have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May they not be separated from the happiness that is free of sorrow. And may they rest in equanimity, free of attachment and aversion. Mandala Offering <clears throat> An infinite array of worlds, each with four continents and the wealth of infinite oceans of realms. I bring them all to mind and offer them without exception. Please hold with compassion all of the beings they contain. My body enjoyments whatever I own, my aggregates elements and sense sources, my aspirations now and in times to come, as well as everything I grasp as mine. By offering them all, may I be blessed with the end of self-grasping, completely liberated from the bounds of real and unreal, transcending the names and attributes of arising, cessation, and abiding, coming and going, affirmation and denial. The Supreme Mandala is the supernatural state. By offering it, may I be blessed to attain the state of Buddhahood. Om Guru Deva Dakini Ratna Mandala Pratija Soha Namo to the Guru, the utter purity of all appearance and existence. I offer all appearance and existence, arisen as the primordial ground. I supplicate you, may the three realms be completely liberated. Please grant blessings to empty samsara from its depths. Lords with five omniscient wisdoms, crown ornament, kind ones with loving nature, precious protectors of beings, hearts of all Buddhas, inexpressible by word or thought, I supplicate you from the core of my mind. Bless me from within the state of Dharmata. Bless us to realize this mind, primordially pure and unborn, as the unfathomable Mother Ocean, Dharmakaya. Please turn the wheel of the Dharma, of the greater and lesser vehicles and the teachings, common to both, according to the dispositions and mental capacities of sentient beings. Now, um, today, we will uh, be offering a recitation um, on the sutra, the teaching on the indivisible nature of the realm of phenomena. And um, just before we get into it, I will read a short summary regarding the sutra. And um, it is from, it's the translation on the 84,000 uh, reading room. Um, and uh, if there's any errors in translations, I humbly confess and request the sublime ones to have patience um, 
and dedicate this uh, presentation for the benefit of all, all mother sentient beings throughout space. Um, so yes, if I mispronounce any uh, Sanskrit names or uh, and so forth, I will do my absolute best. As the sutra opens, the Buddha, residing in the Jeddah Grove, asks Manjushri to teach on the nature of reality. Manjushri offers a playful and profound response that questions whether the very idea of such a teaching is at all intelligible. How could that which is present everywhere possibly be singled out and set apart from anything? This short-circuiting of the dichotomy between relative and ultimate truths, of the distinction between appearance and reality, recurs throughout the sutra. Manjushri's uncompromising account, however, is too much for some of the monks present in the gathering, and they leave, feeling upset. But then, by means of an emanation, Manjushri skillfully teaches the distraught monks who return expressing gratitude and explaining their, that their obstacle had been a conceited sense of attainment, of which they are now free. Manjushri is then requested to teach on the non-duality and the nature of the Bodhisattva. Thus, as an upshot of its radically, radically non-dual approach, the sutra identifies the very notion of spiritual attainment as an obstacle, classified as an affliction, and associated with samsara. Yet it also teaches that true knowledge of affliction and samsara is itself the purification of both. The sutra's dramatic storyline culminates with the transformation of both Papyan, the ruler of the Maras, who create obstacles for those following the Dharma, and Shariputra, who is the very image of spotless piety, into awakened Buddhas. The two then engage in an astonishing Dharma dialogue explaining the profound intent of Manjushri's teaching. Alrighty, so that was the summary, the introduction of the Noble Mahayana Sutra, the teaching on the indivisible nature of the realm of phenomena. The translation. The teaching on the indivisible nature of the realm of phenomena. Homage to all Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Thus did I hear at one time, the Blessed One was in the Jeddah Grove in Anatta Pindara's park at Shravasti. He was residing there together with a great Sangha of 8,000 monks and with 12,000 Bodhisattvas from various Buddha realms and 32,000 gods who had all genuinely entered into unexcelled and perfect awakening. Youthful Manjushri and the god Rat Ratnavara had also joined the gathering and were present there. Ratnavara, at that time, thought to himself, If the Blessed One encourages youthful Manjushri to teach the Dharma, he will, sure, he will surely teach so that all the abodes of the Maras will be subdued, and Mara, the evil one, will despair. He will teach so that all opponents are defeated, and so that all those possessed of excessive pride will become free of their pride and reveal their knowledge. He will teach so that those engaged in yogic practices will achieve their fruition and so that those who have already achieved fruition will gain further distinction. In this way, the lineage of the Buddha Dharma and Sangha will continue unbroken, so that numerous beings will arouse the mind set on awakening. The awakening that the thus gone one has gained, has gained over incalculable eons will long remain and expand. Whether the thus gone one has gained over incalculable eons will long remain and expand. Excuse me, I've read that over twice. Whether the thus gone one remains or passes entirely into nirvana, the teaching of the Dharma will cause those who hear it to pass quickly beyond suffering, by means of whichever vehicle may inspire them. Would it not be wonderful were youthful Manjushri to deliver such a teaching? The Blessed One knew in his mind what the god Ratnavara was thinking, and so he said to youthful Manjushri, Manjushri, the gathering here wishes to hear the Dharma from you. Therefore, please go ahead, speak some words to those who are gathered here. In response, youthful Manjushri inquired, Blessed One, where should I begin my teaching? Manjushri, replied the Blessed One, you should begin by teaching the nature of the realm of phenomena. 
which is a synonym for emptiness or the ultimate nature of things. The Blessed One said, Manjushri, if those who are possessed of excessive pride hear that teaching, it will frighten them. Those who become afraid, said Manjushri, are themselves of the nature of the realm of phenomena, and the nature of the realm of phenomena does not become frightened. At that point, the Venerable Shari Dvati Putra addressed youthful Manjushri. Manjushri, he said, you say that all phenomena are the nature of the realm of phenomena, but within the nature of the realm of phenomena, there is no affliction, nor is there purification. How is it then that sentient beings get afflicted or purified? Manjushri replied, Venerable Shari Dvati Putra, childish and ordinary beings are stricken by the errors of the view of the transitory collection, also known as the construction of personal identity in relation to the five aggregates. In those who persist in the belief in I and mine, there arises the conception of self and other. In those who conceive of self and other, there, ar there arises a virtuous and unvirtuous mind and the mental states that arise from it. The mind and the various factors arising from it then condition the formation of virtuous and unvirtuous actions, and for them, that cause and those conditions bring about their particular forms of ripening according to their particular natures. Venerable Shari Dvati Putra, for as long as such beings take birth within the realms of existence, that is what we call affliction. However, Venerable Shari Dvati Putra, for as long as such beings take birth within the realms of existence, Excuse me. However, Venerable Shari Dvati Putra, affliction is the very realm of, is the very nature of the realm of phenomena. Hence, to know that affliction is indeed the very nature of the realm of phenomena is what we call purification. Ultimately, there is no affliction or purification, and nothing is afflicted or purified. When youthful Manjushri gave this teaching, 100 proud monks liberated their minds from defilement with no further appropriation. Venerable Shari Dvati Putra then said to youthful Manjushri, Manjushri, as you gave this teaching, 100 proud monks liberated their minds from defilement. With no further appropriation, Manjushri, the realm of phenomena is flowing from you. Manjushri said, Venerable Shari Dvati Putra, what do you think? Is the nature of the realm of phenomena something that was bound in the past and later liberated? Manjushri, the nature of the realm of phenomena was not bound in the past, nor is it later liberated. Well, Venerable Shari Dvati Putra, from what mind state were those monks liberated? Manjushri, the thus gone one has trained many hearers, and so their minds are liberated from defilement with no further appropriation. Venerable Shari Dvati Putra, are you one of the thus gone one's hearers? I am, Manjushri. I am one of one among the thus gone one's hearers. Venerable Shadi Dvati Putra, is your mind free from appropriation and liberated from defilements? Indeed, Manjushri, it is liberated. Venerable Shadi Dvati Putra, was your mind liberated in the past? Will it be in the future? Or is it being liberated at present? Venerable Shadi Dvati Putra, the characteristic of past mind is that it has ceased. The characteristic of future mind is that it has not yet occurred and the characteristic of present mind is that it does not remain. That being so, Venerable Shari Devati Putra, and which of these is that liberation of your mind? Sh Venerable Shari Devati Putra replied, Manjushri, this mind was not liberated in the past, is not being liberated at present, nor will it be in the future. Manjushri responded, Well then, Venerable Shari Devati Putra, what is this liberated mind of yours? To this, Shadidvati Putra answered, Manjushri, it is only in relative terms that a mind is said to be liberated. Ultimately, there is no bound or liberated mind to be observed. Manjushri asked him, Would you say that the nature of the realm of phenomena is relative or ultimate? Shadidvati Putra replied, Manjushri, within the nature of the realm of phenomena, neither the relative nor the ultimate can be observed. Manjushri asked him, Venerable Shari Dvati Putra, how, then, can you declare that the mind is liberated in relative terms? So, Shari Dvati Putra asked, Manjushri, is there then never any mind that is liberated at all? 
Manjushri answered, Venerable Sharid Putra, if there were a mind to be observed, inside, outside, or in between, then there could also be a liberated mind. However, Venerable Sharid Putra, there is no mind to be observed inside, outside, or in between, and therefore there is no bondage or liberation whatsoever. At that point, Two hundred monks from that retinue heard this teaching by Manjushri and rose from their seats, getting ready to leave. They said, If nobody was ever liberated, and nobody ever will be, what is the point of our going forth and taking vows to become monks? If there is no such thing as deliverance at all, then what, is, what purpose would it serve to train on the path? Disapproving and disconcerted, they then left the gathering. Considering what ought to be done to train those monks, youthful Manjushri projected an emanation in the form of a monk on the road in front of them. When they encountered the emanation, the monks asked him, Where do you come from, Venerable One? Venerable Ones, he replied. I do not wish to participate in the Dharma teaching that youthful Manjushri is now giving. I now understand it. I am not interested in it, interested in it, and I do not believe in it. Hence, I have left the gathering. The two hundred monks concurred. We do not wish to be present at Manjushri's Dharma teaching either. We do not understand it, we are not interested in it, and we do not believe it. Therefore, we have also left the gathering. Addressing the two hundred monks, the emanated monk asked them, What were the disagreeable points in youthful Manjushri's Dharma teaching that made you leave the gathering? The monks replied, Venerable One, youthful Manjushri declared that nobody ever achieves anything, and that there is no such thing as gaining realization and liberation. At that point we thought, if nobody ever gains any attainment, realization or liberation, then what purpose would there be in our going forth? And why should we have taken vows to become monks? Why should we observe celibacy? If there were no such thing as deliverance at all, what purpose would it serve to train on the path? It was with these thoughts in mind that we left the gathering. The emanated monk asked the group, Venerable ones, did you simply leave because you did not appreciate what was being said? Or did you reject the teaching and express your displeasure in words? They replied, We just left because we did not like it. We did not reject the teaching, nor as we left did we say anything unpleasant. Well done, said the emanated monk. Venerable ones, to refrain from dispute is the foremost training for spiritual practitioners. Therefore, without saying anything offensive and without arguing against this teaching, let us try to follow it for a while. Venerable ones, would you say that the mind is blue or is it yellow or is it red or white? Or would you say that it is similar to the color of matter or of a crystal? Is it real or should we call it unreal? Is it permanent or would you say it is impermanent? Does it have a form or would you say that it is formless? The monks replied, Venerable one, the mind does not have any form and it cannot be expressed, it cannot be shown. It has no appearance yet is unimpeded. It has no dwelling and is imperceptible. The emanated monk then asked the group, Venerable ones, the mind that has no form and cannot be shown, that has no appearance, is unimpeded, has no dwelling, and is imperceptible, do you think that it is to be observed as something that can be said to dwell inside, or to dwell outside, or to dwell in between? No, it is none of these, said the monks. So the emanation continued, if the mind has no form, cannot be shown, has no appearance, is unimpeded, without dwelling and imperceptible, if it is not to be observed inside nor outside nor in between, do you think it is real and established? No, it is not, answered the monks. Do you then think, venerable ones, that a mind that is not real and not established can nevertheless be liberated? No, it cannot, they replied. Venerable ones, the emanation continued, Now consider youthful Manjushri's teaching. He said that within the nature of the realm of phenomena that there is neither affliction nor purification. Venerable ones, the minds of childish and ordinary beings, stricken by errors, give rise to the belief in I and mine. As they persist in that belief 
in eye, and mind, they continuously engage with objects and abide on them. As such, a mind that arises from observation comes into being. But when that observation ends, that mind will also end, disintegrate, and no longer remain. It is the observing mind that goes forth, takes vows, and becomes a monk. Yet the mind that practices the path has no intrinsic existence, is not real, and does not occur. And that which is non-existent, unreal, and non-occurring knows neither arising, disintegrating, nor remaining. That which neither arises, disintegrates, nor remains cannot be bound and cannot be liberated. It knows neither attainment nor realization. Venerable ones, it was with this in mind that youthful Manjushri said, Within the nature of the realm of phenomena, there is neither affliction nor purification. Nobody ever attains anything. There is no realization and no liberation. When the emanated monk had given them this teaching, the minds of the monks, with no further appropriation, were liberated from defilement. With their minds liberated, they now returned to youthful Manjushri. Covering themselves with their upper robes, they addressed him as follows. Manjushri, you have protected us. We have avoided giving up the Dharma, and henceforth we will never relinquish the practice of the profound Vinayan, Vinaya Dharma. <coughs> Hearing this, Venerable Sabuti asked the monks, What are your attainments, and what type of realization have you gained, that you now cover yourselves with your upper robes before Manjushri? The monks replied, Venerable Sabuti, we have neither attained nor realized anything at all. That is why we now cover ourselves with our upper robes before Manjushri. Venerable Sabuti, when we had the sense of having attained something, we rose from our seats and left the gathering. Now free from that sense of attainment, here we are again. Venerable ones, inquired Sabuti, what makes you say this? They replied, Venerable Sabuti, to speak of attainment is boastful and conceited, and whoever is boastful and conceited has neither attainment nor realization. Venerable Sabuti, one who has neither any attainment nor realization has truly vanquished all forms of conceit. Venerable ones, asked Venerable Sabuti, Who has trained you? Eminent Sabuti, they replied, We have been trained by him who has no attainment or realization, for, for whom there is no birth and no passing beyond suffering, and who is neither composed nor distracted. How, Sabuti asked, did you get trained? Ask Manjushri, they replied. So the Venerable Ananda now inquired, Manjushri, who has trained these monks? In reply, Manjushri explained, Venerable Ananda, these monks have been trained by one for whom there are no aggregates, no elements, and no sense sources, one who is neither an ordinary being nor someone who trains, nor someone beyond training, one who is neither a hearer, nor a bodhisattva, nor a thus gone one, one who has no body, no speech, and no mind, one for whom there is neither connection nor separation, what sort of teacher is that? inquired Ananda. In reply, Manjushri asked, Venerable Ananda, what do you think? If the thus gone one produces an emanation, is that emanation connected with something? No, replied Ananda. Such an emanation would not be connected with any phenomenon, yet neither would it be separate from anything. Manjushri asked, Venerable Ananda, are all phenomena essentially like emanations? Yes, Manjushri, they are replied Ananda. Venerable Ananda, Manjushri said, these monks were trained by an emanation, and whenever hearers are trained, it is like being trained by an emanation. Venerable Ananda, whenever training occurs in that way, the training is genuine. Know that those who have no interest in this very Dharma teaching are excessively proud. Manjushri said, Venerable Ananda, how can monks who have no such interest be seen to have excessive pride? Manjushri replied, Venerable Ananda, Monks who conceitedly consider themselves pure, because of their pure aggregates of discipline, are excessively proud. Those who conceitedly think of themselves as pure because they have pure aggregates of absorption, insight, liberation, and liberated wisdom vision, such individuals should be seen as excessively proud. Thinking, I have gained the attainments and achieved direct perception, they pride themselves on those achievements, such thoughts should be viewed as excessive pride. Those who are fear fearful of the view of the transitory collection and relish the taste of the, of the one path to be traveled 
should be viewed as excessively proud. Why is that? Because that emptiness by virtue of which the view of the transitory collection is empty is also the emptiness of virtue of which the single traversed path is empty. So those who do not engage correctly with such empty things because of their emptiness should be seen as excessively proud. Moreover, Venerable Ananda, you should understand that monks who use emptiness to make the emptiness of the view of the transitory collection, the same emptiness as the emptiness of the one path to be traveled, are excessively proud. Why is that? Because, Venerable Ananda, emptiness and the view of the transitory collection are not two different things. The view of the transitory collection is itself emptiness, nor are emptiness and the path two different things. The path itself is itself emptiness. Moreover, Venerable Ananda, any monk who fears ignorance and the cravings of existence and relishes the taste of liberation from ignorance should also be seen as excessively proud. Why is that? Because, Venerable Ananda, whoever engages in them with the perception that they are two things is not liberated. Venerable Ananda, some, f some monks are frightened by desire, anger, and delusion and relish the taste of the three gateways of liberation. Some are frightened by the four errors, and hence relish the taste of the four perceptions. The four errors being, for reference, taking what is impermanent to be permanent, what is painful to be delightful, what is unclean to be clean, what is no self to be a self, which are the four errors, and hence relish the taste of the four perceptions. Some are frightened by the five obscurations, and so relish in the five faculties. Some are frightened by the six sense organs, and instead relish the six super-knowledges. Some are frightened by the seven bases of consciousness, and instead relish the taste of the seven branches of awakening. Some are frightened by the eight flaws, and hence relish the taste of the eightfold path of the noble ones. Some are frightened by the nine conditioned entities, and instead relish the taste of the nine successive attainments. Some are frightened by the path of action, associated with the ten non-virtues, and instead relish the experience of the ten qualities of no more training. Some are frightened by the conditioned elements, and instead relish the taste of the unconditioned elements. All such monks should be known to be excessively proud. And why? Venerable Ananda, because all of that amounts to boasting, conceit, and construction. Venerable Ananda, However much a monk is involved in boasting conceit construction, thoughts of something high, thoughts of something low, appropriation, relinquishment, conceptualization, dependence, clinging, and superimposition, that much will be afflicted by excessive pride. Hence, Venerable Ananda, all such monks should be known as excessively proud. And why is that? Because, Venerable Ananda, anyone who does not engage with emptiness, the emptiness that is the emptiness of the conditioned elements, and the emptiness that is the emptiness of the unconditioned elements, as sameness, must be known as excessively proud. Venerable Ananda then asked youthful Manjushri, Excessively proud. Manjushri replied, Venerable Ananda, a monk who, because he himself is at peace within, sees all outer objects as at peace. Such a monk has no conceited ideas about the same or not the same, knowledge or ignorance, perception or non-perception, the conditioned or the, non un or the unconditioned. He does not think, does not conceive, does not divide things in two, does not unite them in one, does not accept, does not reject, does not scatter, and does not cling. He truly observes that while all phenomena are the same as the limit of reality, they are the same through a sameness that is beyond being the same or being not the same, and there is nothing whatsoever to be made the same or to be made not the same. He does not truly observe anything that is that sameness, hence he has no conceit, does not think, does not conceive, and does not cling. It goes without saying that he is without any conceit regarding his attainment his understanding, or his realization. There is no basis for it. Venerable Ananda, such a monk is free from excessive pride. For him there is no remedy and no position. He is free of a position for himself and a position for others. All feelings have been interrupted, he is free from feeling. From all absence of feeling, from all perceptions, all thoughts, and all ways of directing the mind. 
He has no bondage and no appropriation. He is at peace, thoroughly at peace, utterly at peace. Since he has no thought of I or mine, he does not truly observe that there is any quality to relinquish, understand, or realize. When a monk is like this, he does not harbor any excessive pride. When he understands the sameness of all phenomena by means of the sameness of the element of space, he will not superimpose on any phenomena that they are virtuous or unvirtuous, evil or good, defiled or undefiled, mundane or supramundane, conditioned or unconditioned. While not making such superimpositions, he will also not develop conceit about them, will not think about them, and will not conceive of them, for he does not truly observe them. Without superimposing anything on phenomena, he understands that they are all the same in their very sameness, the very same, just like space. Venerable Ananda, any monk who becomes inspired in this way is known as truly and fully liberated. That is why he is not proud. It is with this in mind that the Blessed One has taught. Space does not stick to the palm of one's hand. So too are a spiritual practitioner's qualities. When Manjushri had given this teaching, 200 monks experienced their mind's liberation from defilement with no further appropriation. And appropriation, for reference, also means grasping or clinging, but has a particular meaning as the ninth of the twelve links of dependent arising between craving and becoming or existence. At that point, the god Ratnavara inquired of youthful Manjushri, Manjushri, how should a bodhisattva who is free from pride reveal his knowledge? In reply, Manjushri explained, Divine being, the omniscient mind, the mind that is equal to the unequaled, the mind that is superior to all of the three worlds, the mind that is entirely beyond the hearers and solitary Buddhas, when bodhisattvas do not perceive that mind to be present, inside, outside, or both, such bodhisattvas do not perceive any movement of the mind toward external objects or abiding anywhere, and yet their mind does move for the sake of accumulating roots of virtue, ripening sentient beings, and upholding the sacred dharma. Thus their omniscient mind expresses itself to other sentient beings and to other, pers and to other persons while they understand that mind too has the essential nature of the limit of reality. When asked, they reply that through the essential nature of their mind, they understand the essential nature of all beings. Through the essential nature of all beings, they understand the essential nature of all phenomena. Through the essential nature of all phenomena, they understand the essential nature of all roots of virtue. Through the essential nature of all root of virtue, they reveal the essential nature of a bodhisattva. This divine being is the bodhisattva's revelation of the correct knowledge. Divine being, moreover, when bodhisattvas, as they practice generosity, give by relinquishing the gift, the giver, the recipient, the context of giving and the purpose of the gift, such bodhisattvas rely on nothing and do not remain fixed on anything. They have no attachment, do not hope for anything, do not focus on anything, and do not truly observe anything. When asked, they reply that they understand that the essential nature of giving is utter relinquishment utter absence of goals, and utter emptiness. Through the essential nature of giving, they understand the essential nature of the limit of reality. Through the essential nature of the limit of reality, they understand the essential nature of all phenomena. Through the essential nature of all phenomena, they understand the essential nature of all beings. And through the essential nature of all beings, they reveal the essential nature of a bodhisattva. This divine being is the bodhisattva's revelation of their correct knowledge purified through generosity. Divine being, moreover, when bodhisattvas, being physically at peace, understand that discipline is at peace, and being verbally and mentally at peace, understand that discipline is at peace, and being physically, verbally, and mentally at peace, understand that awakening is at peace, and as awakening is at peace, understand that all sentient beings are at peace, and as all sentient beings are at peace, understand that all phenomena are at peace. And as all phenomena are at peace, understand that the limit of reality is known as at peace. For them, as the limit of reality is at peace, they are at peace, thorough peace, and utter peace. 
Hence, when asked, they reveal that all phenomena are at peace. This divine being is the Bodhisattva's revelation of their correct knowledge purified through discipline. Divine being, moreover, when Bodhisattvas understand the utterly fleeting, momentary, and hollow nature of reality, they are patient regarding all the woes that sentient beings may cause, and patient without their minds being actuated externally or internally, and without directing any aggressive contemplation externally, they are patient, ah, excuse me, being actuated externally or internally, and without directing any aggressive contemplation externally, they are patient regarding all the misdeeds of sentient beings. They, un they understand that the essential nature of all beings is the essential nature of peace, of patience, excuse me. They understand the, that the essential nature of all beings is the essential nature of patience, that the essential nature of patience is the essential nature of awakening, and that the essential nature of awakening is the essential nature of all phenomena. They thus understand also that all phenomena are of the essential nature of the limit of reality. When asked, they reply that because they understand the fleeting, momentary, and hollow nature of reality, they reveal their patience by not being moved. This divine being is the Bodhisattva's revelation of their correct knowledge, purified through patience. Divine being, moreover, when bodhisattvas understand the teaching of disengagement from all contemplation and are free of superimpositions, their diligence will have equanimity, and they will truly observe that whatever exertion they might undertake is itself disengagement. With this inward disengagement, without moving outward, they move to ripen others. Through the disengagement of their diligence, they understand the disengagement of sentient beings. Through the disengagement of sentient beings, they understand the disengagement of awakening. Through the disengagement of awakening, they understand the disengagement of all phenomena. Through the disengagement of all phenomena, they understand the, the disengagement of all, the limit of reality. When asked, they reveal that their diligence is disengaged in just the same way as all those things are, by their nature, disengaged. This divine being is the Bodhisattva's revelation of their correct knowledge, purified through diligence. Divine being, moreover, when Bodhisattvas practice concentration on all phenomena being the same and having no differences, they do not place their minds to remain in that concentration and make their consciousness dwell on it. Without their... Excuse me. Dwell on it, without their consciousness dwelling on it, they understand through the sameness of mind that concentration is sameness. Through the sameness of their concentration, they understand the sameness of awakening. Through the sameness of awakening, they understand the sameness of all sentient beings. Through the sameness of all sentient beings, they understand the sameness of all phenomena. They know that it is in this way that all phenomena are said to be the same. When asked, they reveal that, because they are all of just that sameness, by nature, all phenomena are sameness. This divine being is the Bodhisattva's revelation of their correct knowledge purified through concentration. Divine being, moreover, when Bodhisattvas see all phenomena through their pure wisdom, by means of the eye of insight, they do not truly see any phenomenon. When they see in that way, in which they do not truly see any phenomena, there is nothing at all. Having attained an understanding of there not being anything at all, they do not move, proceed, or transfer anywhere. Having interrupted all moving, proceeding, and transferring, they do not transmigrate. They do not transmigrate at all. Why is that? It is because they have interrupted what sets transmigration in motion, desire, craving and wishing. Without pursuing any desires at all, they intentionally move through various births in order to ripen beings, gather the factors of awakening, uphold the sacred dharma, and ensure the unbroken continuity of the lineage of the Three Jewels. They move without moving and without upsetting the characteristic, the characteristic purity of the nature of all phenomena. As this is their insight, through the nature of insight, they understand awakening. Through the nature of awakening, they understand the nature of sentient beings. Through the nature of sentient beings, they understand the nature of all phenomena. And they also know 
that all phenomena are of the, of the nature of the limit of reality. When asked, they reveal the indivisible nature of the realm of phenomena. This divine being is the Bodhisattva's revelation of their correct knowledge purified by means of the eye of insight. Divine being, moreover, when Bodhisattvas observe the body and apply mindfulness, they know that the body of the past was unborn. They know that the body of the future does not transfer, and they understand that the present body is similar in essence to grass, trees, walls, rocks, or visual aberrations. When they observe the body, they understand that the nature of the body is non-arising, and so they do not instigate any contemplation that involves notions of a body. Those who do not instigate contemplation will not dwell on any concerns. Free from concerns and with a consciousness that does not dwell, they train in observing the body and applying mindfulness to it. They, yet they neither cultivate nor eliminate any phenomena at all. Having understood that all phenomena are without reality, they observe the body with the understanding that the mind that observes the body is also just like a magical illusion or an echo. With this insight, they are neither attached to pleasant feelings nor hostile to painful ones. And since they are also not confused with respect to feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant, they are not predisposed to ignorance. When they are no longer ravished by feelings, then this is their application of mindfulness to the observation of feelings. As they observe and dwell on feelings, their minds are not moved by any movement of their feelings about phenomena, and as their minds therefore do not dwell upon any phenomena, they do not abandon, discard, or relinquish the mind of awakening. This is their application of mindfulness to the observation of the mind. With their knowledge of phenomena actualized, they observe phenomena. At that point, they are free from mindfulness and contemplation, and so they understand the intrinsic nature. They, have no, they no longer entertain any notions, contemplation, views, or entanglements with regard to body, feelings, mind, or phenomena. This is their application of mindfulness to the observation of phenomena. They understand all phenomena to be intrinsically non-arising and devoid of substance, like the essential nature of space. Hence, when asked, they reveal their applications of mindfulness through being free of mindfulness and conditioning. This divine being is the Bodhisattva's revelation of their correct knowledge, purified by means of the applications of mindfulness. Divine being, moreover, the correct knowledge of Bodhisattvas is what causes them to assimilate the mind of omniscience, to notice it, stabilize it, ensure that it is not lost, ensure that there is no distraction from it, and ensure that it is not forgotten. At the beginning, it precedes all roots of virtue, it is free from stinginess and relinquishes all possessions. It abandons attitudes of flawed discipline, and, and in the aggregate of discipline it is without dwelling. It harbors no virtue. Uh, excuse me. It... Oh, I lost my place. It precedes all virtue, uh, all roots of virtue. It is free from stinginess and relinquishes all possessions. It abandons attitudes of flawed discipline, and in the aggregate of discipline it is without dwelling. It harbors no wish to harm any being. It is free of strife, and it is without dwelling. And it afflicts no injury with body, speech, or mind. It does not practice the diligence of a listener or a solitary Buddha, but does but does undertake the diligence of the great vehicle, and does not direct the mind to unvirtuous phenomena or pay attention to them, but cultivates non-dwelling in any concentration or equi equilibrium. It does not move toward all the aspects of a view, and does not project out to phenomena. It engages with all phenomena without mediation. It engages with the thoughts of sentient beings. It does not move towards objects. It adheres to noble beings and does not associate with those who are not noble. It is irreproachable with respect to the actions of body, speech, and mind. It is assiduously careful and pursues the qualities of the Buddhas. Without needing direction, it comprehends all needs. It is pure without relin or having relinquished desire, anger, and bewilderment. Since its discipline is flawless, it is free from all torments and is not involved with mistaken practices. Because of its complete inner purity, it is free from hypocrisy, and because of its purity with respect to speech, it knows no flattery. 
content with what it finds, it does not search. Having abandoned negative form. Having abandoned. Ooh, I lost my place. Because of its complete inner purity, it is free from hypocrisy. And because of its purity, it with respect to speech, it knows no flattery. Content with what it finds, it does not search. Having abandoned negative forms of livelihood, it does not take over others' property. Content with the bare necessities, it knows no deceit. Not aiming for the three worlds, it has modest wishes. Free from unvirtuous wishes, it is content. Inclined to the disengagement of all phenomena, it is disengaged. Having relinquished mundane activities, it keeps few things. Having cut through all mental constructs, it is free from thoughts. Without intention, anger, fear, or bewilderment, it is immutable. Having conquered pride, it takes delight in the Dharma. With a well-trained mind, it is noble. With the aggregate of discipline, it is guarded in all respects. With the aggregate of absorption, this mind does not dwell anywhere. With the aggregate of insight, this mind is liberated. Never does it abandon the lineage of the noble ones, nor does it ever spoil the view of the mind of awakening. It does not pursue gain and honor, nor does it pander to others. It guards itself for the sake of guarding others. Being certain of its own intentions, it does not seek the mistakes of others. Observing discipline, it is free from all fears. Without being tight-fisted, it shares the Dharma. It protects the mental activities of all beings. At the beginning, it precedes all virtuous dharmas. Experiencing all phenomena as of one taste, it is beyond differences with respect to activity. Having conquered all forms of conceit, it is free from conceit. In the discernment that there is no birth, it intentionally takes birth in order to ripen sentient beings. And in the discernment that all phenomena are empty from the beginning, too, it also ripens sentient beings so as to subdue all views. While acting in full acquaintance with the absence of marks, it nevertheless considers all sentient beings who engage with marks. Without any wishes, it nevertheless perfects all aspirations for the sake of omniscient wisdom. In the discernment of the absence of formations, it is nevertheless insatiable in forming roots of virtue. Since it sees entities as non-entities, it comprehends both entity and non-entity. Free from any concerns, it does not keep anything in mind. Leading sentient beings to the absence of self, it knows the self to be without self. Relinquishing affliction while not relinquishing sentient beings, it is both relinquishing and non-relinquishing. Cultivating skillful means and insight, it is peaceful, beyond both peace and lack of peace. In distinction from hearers and solitary Buddhas, it proceeds without proceeding. Beyond the paths of the Maras, this is the path of no path. In distinction from childish ordinary beings, this is the activity of non-action. As it understands all phenomena, it is sameness that neither raises things up nor puts them down without any conceded superiority over others. It does not make proclamations regarding itself. Perfecting all the qualities of a Buddha, it is unequaled understanding. Accepting all phenomena as unborn and unceasing, it is the acceptance of the non-arising of phenomena. Divine being, such is the knowledge of bodhisattvas. Divine being, being unborn and unoriginated is not what bodhisattvas' minds are like. Rather, bodhisattvas' minds embrace birth within cyclic existence and perfect the qualities of the Buddha. Being despondent and free from desire is not what bodhisattvas' minds are like. Rather, bodhisattvas' minds take delight, supreme delight, in correct, n correctly knowing the qualities of the Buddha. Being without connection to future existence is not what bodhisattvas' minds are like. Rather, bodhisattvas' minds know the way to take birth. A complete severance is not what the bodhisattvas' minds are like. Rather, bodhisattvas' minds are a continuity of roots of virtue. A lack of concern for the root of virtue is not what bodhisattvas' minds are like. Rather, bodhisattvas' minds are insatiable for the roots of virtue. Relinquishing the process of taking birth within the three realms is not what bodhisattvas' minds are like. Rather, bodhisattvas' minds knowingly take birth to ripen sentient beings. Eliminating only their own afflictions is not what bodhisattvas' minds are like. Rather, bodhisattvas' minds work diligently to eliminate the afflictions of all sentient beings. Acting for themselves is not what bodhisattvas' minds are like. 
Rather, bodhisattvas' minds act to pacify the suffering of all sentient beings. Leaving anyone uncared for is not what bodhisattvas' minds are like. Rather, bodhisattvas' minds reach out to ripen sentient beings. Exhausting desire, anger, bewilderment, and affliction is not what bodhisattvas' minds are like. Rather, bodhisattvas' minds have complete knowledge of desire, anger, bewilderment, and affliction. Actualizing the qualities of cessation is not what bodhisattvas' minds are like. Rather, bodhisattvas' minds have complete familiarity with cessation. Exhausting defilements is not what bodhisattvas' minds are like. Rather, bodhisattvas' minds are familiar with defilement by means of root of virtue. Actualizing the three gateways of liberation is not what bodhisattvas' minds are like. Rather, bodhisattvas' minds are familiar with the three gateways of liberation. Putting down the load of the five aggregates is not what bodhisattvas' minds are like. Rather, bodhisattvas' minds cause all beings to put down their loads. Blocking the six faculties is not what bodhisattvas' minds are like. Rather, bodhisattvas' minds know all the different faculties of beings, whether superior or not. Bringing an end to birth is not what bodhisattvas' minds are like. Rather, bodhisattvas' minds engage in the process of taking birth. Attaining the result that is the liberation of the hearers and solitary Buddhas is not what bodhisattvas' minds are like. Rather, bodhisattvas' minds sustain all beings with the result of liberation at the seat of awakening. When Manjushri delivered this section of the teaching on the revelation of correct knowledge, 10,000 beings within the gathering gave rise to the mind of unexcelled and perfect awakening. The Blessed One also expressed his approval to youthful Manjushri, saying, Well said, Manjushri, well said. You have explained the Bodhisattva's revelation of their knowledge well. Manjushri, any Bodhisattva who hears this teaching on the revelation of knowledge and is inspired, fearless, and is unafraid, and does not panic, will awaken to unexcelled and perfect Buddhahood and reveal the correct knowledge of the thus gone ones. Now the god Ratnavara asked youthful Manjushri, Manjushri, do you reveal this knowledge? Manjushri replied, Divine being, had I attained or relinquished something, I might also reveal knowledge. But, divine being, since I have not attained or relinquished anything, what sort of knowledge could I reveal? The god asked, but Manjushri, have you not gained or realized anything from those following, or the following those blessed Buddhas, who are more abundant than the number of grains in the, the sand of the river Ganges? Manjushri replied, Divine being, the blessed Buddhas do not teach the Dharma for the sake of attainment and realization. But how, Manjushri, do they teach the Dharma? Manjushri said, Divine being, the blessed Buddhas teach the Dharma by means of the indivisible nature of the realm of phenomena. They do not teach the Dharma for the sake of no arising, no ceasing, no raising up, no putting down, no coming, no going, no sentient beings, separation from sentient beings, affliction, purification, cyclic existence, or the transcendence of suffering. Divine being, this is how the blessed ones, the blessed Buddhas, teach the Dharma. And here we will pause and begin with part two uh, in continuing our reading on the teaching of the indivisible nature of phenomena as, as pronounced by Manjushri. <laughs> 